Good morning and welcome to the Gospel Loft this morning. Um, we're getting to the 16th part in the letter to the Galatians and also into chapter 5. Now, we forget sometimes that the Bible was originally not written in, in chapters and verses. A, a letter was a continuous document and, and read as such in one go. It, it was only in 1560 that the first Bible, it was the Geneva Bible, was introduced with these divisions, chapters and verses. Now here also, our last verse in chapter 4 does not change the subject, but continues along the same lines, really. And I want to begin with the first verse in chapter 5 today, where it says, Stand therefore fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Well, first subtitle, Stand Fast Therefore. Once we have received Christ as our Savior, we need to put our feet firmly upon the rock of truth. Now, the word therefore always indicates that something has been brought about and there is a reason for whatever has been given. Now, before we get into what this is, we need to see how steadfast and how solid we stand in Christ Jesus. The, the world has feet of clay. And, and it will tumble under the weight of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Our feet ought not to be placed on the uncertain, timely achievements of men, but on the solid promises of God. Now, in Christ we have given feet like the ones he has. And we read about it in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 15, right in the beginning of the verse. And his feet as unto fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace. The test comes always quickly when a little weight is placed on it. Yeah, the weight of persecution, of ridicule, or opposition to what we are saying to the people around us about Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on and he says, stand fast in the liberty. There is a spiritual world where another set of laws is applied. Paul, Paul speaks of liberty in the spirit which pushes the cares of this world right out of the door. Now, the writer to the Hebrews points to a dimension of things to come which cannot be measured with any earthly measure. And, and we want to read something in, in the letter uh, to the Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 4 and, and 6 about this. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gifts. Now this refers to something much greater than what we ever would experience on earth. And then it goes on and says, And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And then the sad part, and if they should fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now the Galatians have tasted of the liberty that has come through grace and grace alone and has saved them from sin. And how far, how far down have they slid on the ladder? There comes a point of no return. Paul wants to catch them before they hit bottom before it is too late and offers them a safety net. But what has it to do with us and our situation in the churches of today? I want to speak to those who have spoken in tongues and prophesied 20 years ago and have been silenced through a worldly spirit, almost denying the power which they have experienced. They have tasted of the world to come. It is a slow, almost hidden spirit of backsliding. The baptism of the Holy Spirit demands spiritual demonstration, or else we make a mockery of the gifts that comes with it. Well, what do you think is liberty uh, that Paul speaks about here? It, it is not to live a sheltered, comfortable life without spiritual responsibility. 
And then he goes on and he says, wherewith Christ has made us free. Romans chapter 8 and verse 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Yes. But what has Jesus done for us? He gave his life for a ransom for us. That we read in Mark chapter 15 and verse 37. And secondly, he was resurrected to, to, prove, to prove God's promise of eternal life. Yes, and that again in Mark 16 and verse 6. And then the third part, he sent the Holy Spirit to teach us about spiritual life. That's in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. And then the next one, he gave spiritual gifts that we may demonstrate them, uh, demonstrate them before the world as a testimony of their own impotence and to edify the church. That we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. And then he gave us men to lead us in the way of righteousness. That's Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. To accept fully that Jesus has done for us causes us to enjoy this liberty. Uh, most of us believe some of the requirements and even walk in them for a short period of time. Every week. I, I, I have said before that every week consists of 10,080 minutes. And how much of these minutes do we actually dedicate to the things of the Lord, spiritually? How much do we spend in prayer, in, in, in reading and studying the Word of God, preaching and testifying, worshipping and praising God, listening to the preached Word, doing spiritual warfare? Most of us do very little of all these and uh, are taken up with the cares of this world, which leads, leads us to the next subtitle. Be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Those are Paul's words to the Galatians. And every false doctrine will entangle us into bondage and will start a chain reaction against truth. Lies can only be backed up with more lies. And soon we are indeed entangled. A bondage goes much further than circumcision or feasts and new moons. In our modern theology we have blatantly abundant sound guidelines. We let children decide what gender they would like to be. Homosexual marriages are performed in churches. We, we have adulterers as church leaders. We have Bollywood and Hollywood on the stage. We have hate speech from the pulpit when prominent preachers condemn brethren who speak in tongues or go another day to church as they do. All, all this brings terrible bondage to the believers and destroys the liberty we enjoy in Christ Jesus. I would like to close this portion with a scripture from 1 Corinthians and it is chapter 14 and verse 40. It's a beautiful guideline let all things be done decently and in order. And then we come to Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 to 9. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. And whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? that you should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul begins with the words, Behold I, Paul, say unto you. It looks as if Paul is pulling rank. We must remember that many miracles were happening when Paul and his team were around. 
So much so that in, in Lystra, when a lame man was healed, they cried out, the gods have come down to us in the form of these men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius. That's what we read in, in Acts chapter 14. Now Lystra, by the way, is in Galatia. It also shows how far these brethren had come with the Lord at the beginning. Yes. And then he goes on and he says, if ye be circumcised, Christ profiteth you nothing. It is not circumcision that keeps you saved, nor has it anything to do with getting saved. We, we have the to-dos and we have the to-bes. To-do is to work for something and to-be is to be something or someone. We are doers of the word, as in be ye holy as I am holy, or, or, or being in Christ. Then there are docu uh, commandments of, of, of loving one another. All these are the reactions to our salvation, and, and, and not the cause or the contributors of it. The theme seems to stay with Paul, and he wants to make sure they understand the risk they are running. They, they, they do not have the problem of New Testament legalism, but the problem of law-keeping. These Judaizers say that, that you must perform circumcision to be saved, and you must be part of Judaism before you can really get saved. But they want them to ensnare them and entangle them with all kinds of laws again. Paul then says that if you trust in circumcision, then you have to trust the whole law and try to find salvation in it. This is impossible. Man has difficulties in understanding that the smallest trespass brings the full judgment, which is eternal death. We cannot negotiate a deal for less punishment with God, like purgatory, for instance, or a lower but still acceptable heaven. There are no gray areas with the Lord, for the price he has paid is too great to leave room for sin of any kind. But then he says, I testify again to every man who is circumcised. Being testimony is more than just making a suggestion or preaching about it and leaving it to the individual to make a decision. The judgment has, be, has, has been given to the circumcision. The law will condemn you to death and grace will save you. The free choice for the Galatians had been made at their conversion. And now Paul makes them aware of the consequences after testimony had been given against them for backsliding, playing games has come to an end. You are for grace or you are against it. There is no middle ground. And we read something in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me is scattering abroad. Those, those are hard words. The scripture has given us clear guidelines to what it means to be for Christ. We, we have the gospels. That, that shows how Christ lived and taught. This is our perfect example of how we ought to follow him because Paul, in another place, he understands this very well to the extent that he could say, follow me as I follow Christ. We read that in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the first verse. Then we have the books of Acts that confirms the history of Christ and the church and, and, and finally, we have the epistles that teach us the practicality of being in Christ. We have it all available to us and are without excuse. Well, then he says that he is a debtor to the whole law. You, you mean that we have to stone people again and keep all these dietary laws and, and the rest of it? The, the Galatians thought that they could do the Muslim thing, having a spiritual scale where sin is weighed against good deeds and good works, and at the same time enjoy salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ. The law is demanding and is unyielding. It makes a debtor out of you that will forever be in debt, never getting free from it. 
It is like a man with 10 credit cards and all are fully indebted. There is no way out of it except someone comes and pays it off and cuts the cards up. The Galatians accepted the full payment from Jesus, cut the heathen cards up, put this, but then came the Judaizers and offered them a new card which they began to use, making debt again. No wonder Paul is mad with them. You see, we, we can't have one foot in the law and one foot in grace. God is not a divided God. He is one God. And we are one people in Jesus Christ. Until next time, God bless you. Amen.